sympathetic courts. Corporations resisted the new laws and the growth of unions, and once again, tragic confrontations erupted. From all of you good workers, good news to you, I'll tell of how the good old union has come in here to dwell. The Bituminous Coal Operators Association, BCOA, currently represents 16 coal companies that jointly negotiate labour contracts with the United Mine Workers of America. Since 1950, BCOA members have paid into pension and benefit trusts that provide for mine workers and their families in the event a company ceases operations. Uh, you work all your life in the mines. I can remember when I was a little girl, my dad said one thing he didn't have to ever worry about was his health care. When he got old and disabled, he would be able to go to the doctor and he would be able to go to buy his medicine. So I think it was February the 1st of 1988, they cut all this health care off for their pensioners and their widows. We're protesting this um, cutting off of our hospitalization. I'm a retired miner. We're protesting the cutting off of our funds and the men they're not uh, given the job seniority and stuff for the men like they should have it really disturbed me when i seen that their health care was taken from them and they couldn't go to the doctor after they'd pull years and maybe some of them was hurt in the mines and all and uh, we started uh, passing out leaflets getting out information letting people know what Pittston had done to our men and our disabled and all. And Pittston has promised, you know, you go in and you get the coal out and we'll give you good health care benefits and we'll take care of you, we'll give you a pension. And now, you know, they don't want to do any of that. And we don't like it. And we'll be here one day longer than what they could last. <laughs> In February 1988, the BCOA contract between Pittston Coal Company and the United Mine Workers of America expired. Pittston withdrew from the BCOA and ceased paying into the Pension and Benefit Trust, saving the company over $18 million in 1988. And they're trying to make us work seven days a week. They're trying to make us work eight hours a day and try to make us work four hours after that any time that they say. Yeah, and we are, we just like anybody else, we want to work eight hours a day, we want to give them eight hours work, but they want to press us on to work in a coal mine where it's nasty, dirty, and it's really defective to our health. And then they keep coming up with this Sunday work. We want our Sundays, but that is not a main issue here. They talk about flexibility, and they want to make it flexible. What they can do with that, they could work my husband like seven days a week if they wanted to. They could work another woman's husband maybe two days a week if they wanted to. They would be part of them like part-time workers. If you're part-time employees, you don't have any benefits. You have to be full-time employees to have benefits. So all they got to do is cut your hours down by hiring more people, starve you to death right on the job without any benefits. They want to be able to lease that mines out to just like somebody else. Okay, then whoever they lease it out, they take the mines, but they don't have to take the men. So we're going to come in here and man it with people from, say, Paramount, which is the other subsidiary, non-union subsidiary. They can bring their people right in here in this lab where I work, take my job, and I've agreed to it if I sign a contract that don't have a successor clause in it. And those are things that we just don't intend to sign. You cut, you cut your own throat when you do. 
the 14 months that they worked without a contract, I joined the Lays Auxiliary and we got out and uh, we let the community be aware of what was coming. So we uh, distributed posters saying this establishment supports the UMWA and we went to the churches and got them involved. And um, so when the strike came down, the community already knew what they were up against. I used to work in the coal mines and I got laid off and I heard that Pittston Coal Company had taken the health care away from the elderly people. And my first reaction is, they can't do that, can they? <laughs> but they did. And uh, it made me angry. So I got involved in this. Struggled to win a just and fair contract. We uh, have been on the picket line. We helped the picket line at Lebanon in front of the corporate office for over a year before our guys come out on strike. They worked 14 months without a contract. We gave them every opportunity to negotiate and sign a fire contract while we were still producing without any of this. They uh, just uh, half-heartedly talked, wouldn't get serious, wouldn't send people that even had the uh, authority to negotiate to the table. You know, just, it was just a joke. I don't think people should have to go on strike to, to get another contract. The company should negotiate with the union and uh, figure out what the best thing is. If, if people can progress a little bit and the company can make money, then we'll all make a good living. But uh, this up here is just, just strictly union busting. On April 5th, 1989, after working 14 months without a contract and negotiations stalled, the UMWA members employed by Pittston went on strike. The strike affects 1,700 workers in Virginia, West Virginia and Kentucky. Pittston's press releases when they talk about um, union violence in the strike, uh, they'll make these very inflamed and irresponsible statements about union violence and these people are terrorists. Uh, they never define what terrorism is. I'm not going to uh, yield terrorist, terrorist, terror, 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 terrorist. From the men of property, the order's kind. They sent the hired men and troopers to wipe out the diggers' claim, tear down their cottages, destroy their corn. They were dispersed, but still the vision lingers on. You poor take courage, you rich take care. This earth was made a common treasury for everyone to share all things in common, all people one. We come in peace and the orders came to cut them down. Well, Branch Security as a protection team at the company has hard to come in and uh, to protect their property and their, their people. Uh, these men are trained, the, vi uh, the Vance Security and all, they are trained to deal with violence, okay? That's what they're trained, and we're not doing that. We are doing civil disobedience, and they don't know what to do about it. Come on, you sir. take me, you drag me. Go ahead, drag me. This is just not just a coal miner's strike here, it's the people's strike, and it's all of labor's strike. Even if people don't belong to a union, this should be their strike, and this should be the part of their struggle, because 
the system that's being used to adversely affect these workers here, the utilization of the state police, utilization of the United States Marshals, utilization of the federal courts through injunctions and state courts through fines and the jailing uh, 4,000 workers down here is something that adversely affects everyone that has to, to work for a living. I've called it class warfare, and the only thing you need to know about this, if you work, you should be on our side. If you don't, you should be on theirs. When the strike first occurred, state police were sent into the area, and uh, Governor Belisles denied that the state police were escorting coal trucks, which they were. Of course, uh, it's been documented time and time again, the state police actually uh, putting on their traffic vest, stepping down the road, holding up traffic so the coal trucks have free access. And that's part of production. Getting the coal from the mine site to the tipple is production. The state police are involved in production in that they do stop traffic. The coal trucks have direct access to and from the mine site and the tipples. Free access. They don't have to obey the state laws. state of Virginia is handling the situation down here, they are creating a violent situation. And we, we meet with our people every day. And uh, in every meeting that we have, it is stressed nonviolence. And before the strike even began, we informed our people that it would be a nonviolent strike. And we still tell them it's a nonviolent strike. Religious folks are um, their allegiance is to uh, justice and through justice to peace. They do not condone violence and they're willing to participate in activities that call the power of the state into question when it's unjust and certainly call the power of the company into question when it's unjust and will obey the law and will disobey the law when it seems uh, that it's required by uh, the cause of justice and they'll pay the consequences for that when and, when and if we have to pay the consequences that'll be paid but it'll always be peaceful and nonviolent as far as religious folks are involved and that is the commitment of the union as well we were fined today for today only an additional 33.8 million dollars Nine million in the past for driving our cars too slow on the road. I'm on a $10,000 bond for just sitting in the road. And children, we didn't even uh, block traffic. The, the company's lawyer argued it with the judge and told him they broke no law. Let's dismiss it. And he says, no, they will pay for it. They sat in the road. I do personally feel that Fitzson has relied on the state court to uh, place economic pressure on the union through very excessive fines. These fines are outrageous. Uh, it's like a judge said, uh, the miners think we're above the, above the courts. I kind of think we, we damn sure are above the law, you know. He said, if we're above the law, if the law is that damn low to just be something that's used by the companies, then, uh, and, and every time a miners go on strike or workers go on strike, they have an injunction, they just uh, tell them to go to hell and do the things that we have to do to defend our members. Well, the mine workers drew the line at Pittston, and here's what we told them, and here's what I say today after being fined an additional $33.8 million. You take the damn treasury, but you won't take us, and you won't break our strike. We won't retreat. We won't quit until we win at Pittston. The day after the miners all got arrested at McClure Number One Mines, we, you know, the students didn't think it was fair for the way they were treating them. They were real cruel to them. The police were like dragging them and twisting their arms and legs and things like that. And we wanted to show them, the miners, that we were behind them. And as long as they were out, you know, we were out too. And so we all decided to walk out. 
So we walked up to the courthouse where they was arresting them and bringing them there to book them. And we used to go out on the courthouse lawn all day, you know, that day that we walked out. And, you know, just in support of the minors. Just like you, go for a ride to choose. I'd say the first auxiliary got started in November of 1987, and then in January they had all been kicking off, and by March we were going real good. We did our picket line at Lebanon. We did our conventional, I guess, where we passed out the leaflets. We went to Connecticut, and we went to Richmond and did those two things, too. But we did the picket line all summer long and into the winter. Besides being on up there in front of the office picketing, we, uh, we did take over the corporate office up there for about 32, 33 hours. We had fun. We went in at 9 o'clock uh, one morning, and we didn't come out till 4 o'clock the next evening. And when we went in, there was two of us that got to the doors to hold the doors open. We knew if, if they got the inside door shut on us that we didn't have a prior getting on in. So two of us got the doors open till the rest of us could get in. We went in and we went, we sat down. Uh, one of the ladies come out of the office and she said, can I help you? And we didn't say anything and she said, is this a sit-in? And we just started singing. We made the decision and every woman had to make her own decision before she went in there. She knew she was taking a chance on being arrested. <laughs> I mean, never in history has the United Mine Workers had a strike that was sort of bitter or, you know, like this one, that uh, women hasn't played a big role in. We the women auxiliaries, I mean, Brookside, without the women's auxiliary, it would have been lost. It is always. The, I, I'd say the thing that has made this one different is uh, we Instead of just saying we're ladies auxiliary or we're women's auxiliary to the UMWA, we got the catchy name of the Daughters of Mother Jones. We, we didn't tell our names when we went into the Pittston Building because we had in mind that if we were arrested, we were going to tell them that we were the Daughters of Mother Jones. There were 39 women that went in there, and we had numbers from 1 to 39. I was number 14, and that's all we would tell them. The reporter would ask me, uh, what's your name? I'd say, I'm a daughter of Mother Jones, number 14. They'd say, well, who is a, who's Mother Jones? A lot of the reporters didn't even know. She was a strong union leader, and she stood up for the uh, United Mine Workers. She helped organize unions. And anywhere that there was uh, people needed help, Mother Jones was there. I'm so proud of Mother Jones. Oh, really? You know what she did okay. for the union. And, and at that time, she brought the ladies' movement out. I mean, what the women can do. But if I could just do one little thing that she done, I'd be so proud just to be her daughter, because she was one heck of a lady. And if you can't stand by me, you don't stand in my way. Now, union brothers, don't you think the time is right? ever want dignity to go with your life, you have to have a union to help you get it. In a very well-organized and non-violent and peaceful fashion, we occupied one of the largest coal preparation plants in the world for four days. 
Um, and we attracted uh, local support of up to 5,000 people who were blocking the entrance to the plant gate so the state police couldn't get inside. Uh, it was a dramatic confrontation. When has an occupation taken place in the labor movement in this country that goes on for four days and three nights uh, peacefully with 5,000 people in the roads protecting over against the hundreds and hundreds of cars of state police and federal injunctions and the New York Times absolutely refuses to send anybody to that. This bunch of people has drawn the line not just for themselves but for working people throughout the United States and corporate media does not want that known about because it is too inspirational and too educational for other working people throughout the country and it's uh, frightening to them and so it's been blacked out. Strange to me that when uh, workers strike in, in Poland or workers strike in China or workers strike in Russia. We, we read about it in the newspapers every day. But when workers strike here in, in southwestern Virginia and, and the hundreds of thousands of people want to help them and support them and rally around them, nobody ever reads about that in the news media. And there's something inherently wrong with that also. And here's Mr. Bush going around the world praising the role of labor unions in building a democratic society. and. Here in Southwest Virginia, we have the forces of the state and the courts doing all they can to limit the, uh, the expression of uh, workers exercising their, their right to strike. Uh, look at Gorbachev. His miners, they struck over there, and he found a solution. He was concerned. Okay, we strike here in the United States, and our uh, president's out fishing or playing golf. The Wall Street Journal article that was done, I think it was back in July, um, the lead sentence in this front page story on the strike uh, talked about how a wave of violence was enveloping the coal fields. And, uh, you know, you don't expect too much from the Wall Street Journal in terms of uh, fairness when it comes to a labor strike. There's a dramatic example of where the corporate dominated media takes what would benefit Pittston and uh, just glaringly put it on the first page. Oh, I, I think the media coverage hasn't been fair to organized labor. I think it's been very unfair to organized labor. I think it's been very favorable to big business. And, and you know, rightfully so. Why shouldn't they be? Who, who supports them? Who, who runs ads in their newspapers? What they'll do is that in the same sentence, in the next phrase, they'll talk about violence and then they'll put the phrase in there, 3,000 plus miners have been arrested in this strike. And now 3,000 arrests in a strike creates the specter of chaos and violence and terrible things happening, when in fact, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, the 3,000 arrests were for people committing acts of civil disobedience. Not the most effective way that our news has been getting out is through the different uh, unions journals or newsletters, whatever they put out. They do it usually on a monthly basis. And different churches have wrote articles on it in their publications and the nonprofit groups. And that's where the uh, real coverage has went out. One hell of a message to bring to New Yorkers who've been getting uh, false news through the media to really tell them the real nature of the strike and why they should support it. And, you know, we hope that they would follow our words and do the same thing we're doing here. Visit Solidarity Camp, you know, print in the papers, uh, especially in the student movement, to express their solidarity and make sure that the strikers come out a winner because this cause is more than just a minor's cause, it's a worker's cause. We have to stick together. All of us, we realize that the fight you're fighting here in the hills of Virginia is not only your fight, it's the fight of the entire labor movement. And when they take one of us on, they take all of us on. I truly believe in fighting for what, what you believe in, regardless of what it takes. If it's right, if you feel like it's right, fight for it. Because that's the only way you're going to win anymore, is fight. And I believe this old saying of Mother Jones is just pray for the dead and fight like hell for the living. I think we, we still got the problem that, that created this strike. Uh, even if we get a contract tomorrow morning, to, what created this strike 
is the belief by Pittston that, that they had all the power on their side, and that's the judges and the politicians and the system itself. So what we should do is say, we don't want this to happen again to working class people, and we should stay together, band together, as we have been throughout this strike, and work towards changing some of these laws that adversely affect workers, make things better for working class people, so maybe the next time people go on strike, they don't have to deal with this situation. Our governor's against us. Our judges are against us. Most, our troopers are against us. The lawyer, I mean, we don't, we really were standing alone until the people, really until the people come in to help us, to stand with us. And so, it, I think by the people standing together, we can show these big corporations that we can win. By the time this strike's over, it's hard to tell what all we might be doing. I think we can go down in history. <laughs> I think we can go down in history on this thing. And anybody that wants to can be a daughter of Mother Jones. All you got to do is fight injustice wherever it's at. Yeah. <laughs>